Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Dietitians and Nutrition Support Channel. My name is Lauren, and I am joined here today by Michelle, who is a pediatric ICU dietitian in Virginia. Um, Michelle recently wrote a research article about NFPEs, or nutrition-focused physical exams, in the pediatric patient population, and that is set to be published in the upcoming Support Line edition um, coming out in August 2024. So we're very excited to have Michelle here with us today. And Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Um, hopefully you can start us off talking a little bit about maybe some background information about NFPEs and how they're currently used in identifying pediatric malnutrition right now. Thanks for having me. It's really great to be here talking about pediatric NFPE. It's one of my favorite topics. Historically, we started off with SGA um, for the adults, and we had some authors who validated it in pediatrics in 2007. They kept getting asked to explain how to do it because it's really kind of difficult to do exams in children, especially if you don't have any children or you haven't had time to, to work with children. So they did a paper in 2012 explaining how to complete an exam and the, the whole SGNA in pediatrics. So it was very helpful and kind of forward thinking for us in the pediatric area realm. Our current standards for pediatric malnutrition do not currently include a NFPE. Hopefully that's in the future and that I hear they're working on something. So that'll be helpful when that does come out. NFPE is useful though in detecting malnutrition, changes in body composition, sometimes a little earlier than the scales. If you're not getting serial measures, like sometimes in acute settings, you can kind of monitor that a little quicker. Yeah, so that's some, such great background information for us. Um, what kind of information is coming from these NFPEs and why is it so critical that we include this um, as part of that malnutrition assessment in pediatric patients? Good question. For one, anthropometric measures are not always usable. Sometimes we don't get good measures or sometimes it could be a trauma weight or maybe we're doing a telehealth appointment so we don't have the same scale um, measuring the patient. So it's helpful to look to see what's going on with the changes. Um, also growth charts can be not always fair comparisons because they're typically done on healthy children and there's complex kids uh, with medical issues that maybe don't trail, you know, have plot through the normal growth curve. So it's, it's good to see what you know, once you do your measures, what does that look like on the child, on this child? And then if you see the patient again, or you get a good history that from another dietitian or a physician, then you can kind of see where are we today? Uh, some people aren't moving, they're very immobile, and you just want to watch that um, adipose tissue if they don't have a lot of lean body mass. It also helps to differentiate between the type of deficit happening. Are they losing more um, energy, just fat, or are they losing fat and muscle? Beyond the lean tissue and fat muscles, NFPE can identify the micronutrient deficiencies and toxicities. It's critical to look at micronutrient excesses and toxicities, as well as in today's environment, we have fortified and enriched foods, and we have um, supplementation at home and sometimes from other professionals. So for example, during COVID, I would get patients with who were on tube feeding, children like age eight, that would come in and they're getting 500 milligrams of vitamin C once or twice a day, and that's well beyond the normal for them. There's also some children uh, who do not use, they do not get to the RDA volume on the tube feedings because they don't need that much energy. So sometimes we supplement and it's just watching that supplementation and making sure that we're calculating between, you know, what's being given in the tube feeding, the supplements, and then what does that look like on the child? Maybe it's a little bit extra vitamin C and it's not a big deal. Maybe it's a lot of extra zinc and we're still low on iron and it's kicking maybe a potential iron or a copper deficiency. So it's just good to monitor. 
Thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I must say in this article, and I really hope that everyone gets a chance to read through this article when it's released in August, um, there is such great detail in regards to body composition assessment, like way more than I ever knew there was. Um, so I was wondering if you could just give us some of the highlights, talk through a couple of the categories maybe that are included in co body composition and some of those tools and techniques or pros and cons to different ones. There is a lot of body composition in the article, more than I was aware when I started. So I definitely learned um, a lot. There's, you know, you've got your anthropometrics, which we are all aware, weight, um, height or length, and your muscle mid-upper arm circumference. We're all pretty familiar with that in the um, frontal occipital um, circumference as well. But there's the different measures where it's calf measure, um, is that valid in pediatrics? And there's the abdominal circumference. We're doing that a lot in adults, but are we, you know, how valid are we in pediatrics monitoring that? And can we use it as a tool yet? There's DEXA scan, which is being used for bones and body composition. There's bioelectric impedance. Um, there's other measures um, doing the skin fold thickness on the arm versus the the back um, and the ab the side abdomen here. Uh, there's there's just a lot, but are we valid in our measures between groups? I think we we have some groups that are valid, and we have some things that we still need to work on and research. So hopefully that's coming through and will give us greater um, abilities to assess pediatric patients from infancy to teenagers with their body composition kind of complementing the anthropometrics and our visual exam that we do. So when we talk about child versus adult assessments, you know, one of those major differentiators is obviously, you know, children are growing and developing, and we do need to account for that as part of our assessment and our recommendations. So can you share a little bit about how developmental milestones uh, kind of play a role in evaluating that pediatric malnutrition? So, well, first, it's not, it is noted that if you're malnourished as a child and you you're probably going to, might have developmental delays and maybe sexual maturation delays, but it's not valid in any of our diagnoses. It's a notation and a concern to kind of monitor for. And it might be even be a cue of, oh, did I miss a malnutrition diagnosis? So most children will develop through their milestones appropriately, but it's just queuing into, you know, are they walking? Are they talking appropriately? Um, there is a window of, a, you know, early and late. And so it's just watching for those windows and making sure they're moving along. And if there's not, it's conversations with the doctor or just making note of it for next time. The puberty onset, um, the best I can do is give an example. I had a 13 year old who who had cystic fibrosis and she had not, she was still Tanner stage one and she was malnourished. We gave her two feedings and it upped her enzymes and et cetera, and got her to a psychologist. And we wrapped that all in. And within six to nine months, she um, had blossomed. So she was hitting stage three and she, you know, just as a young woman, she blossomed, she was carrying a purse all those little things that aren't important as a diagnosis, but it, um, among, you know, coming of age, these things are important for children to go through. And so we should just take note of if it's not happening, maybe why is it not happening and making sure that it's not malnutrition that's hindering that because it could be a number of other things, but it's helpful to make sure if are they nourished or not to help the doctors answer the questions um, of what else it could it be. There's also the functional status. Um, we don't do um, some functional status or the hand grip as much in pediatrics. I think maybe more in outpatient, but it is helpful that the, S the SGNA has a functional status on there to help us with their assessments. And once I saw that, I actually put that on my assessment so that it just triggers me to automatically ask every single time about the child's status at home normally versus what's changed recently and where are we at now in the ICU after um, whatever they're going through? 
you know, wanting to think a little bit more about the idea of the nervous system in malnutrition, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about, you know, particular deficiencies or excesses for vitamins and minerals and what kind of things are we concerned about in that area? That is tough. Neuro, um, there's a lot of reasons why children um, and infants could have neurological changes. So it's not necessarily saying malnutrition, it's it's the only thing. It's, it's just making note of... Um, of changes. That's why serial assessments are important. But if you hear buzzwords, um, like all of a sudden she stopped walking and she's been walking for two or three years now. So that's a concern. Might not be malnutrition, but you read through the chart doing your medical history and you see she has you know, autism. You also do a good diet history and you learn that she's only eating five or six of the same foods, white, brown foods every single day. So that made some more of a concern for vitamin C deficiency. And we had a lot of kids come through there. So it's become almost um, common for us to make sure our autistic kids on to get a good, clear diet history so that we can catch those um, subtle differences and changes. There was another child who came through who was 15, had never been at our center before, so we didn't have good, you know, serial history to look through, but he had um, loss of cognitive function, loss of sensation, he had some ataxia, some calf tenderness, and some changes with the knee, with the knee reflex, and so it made me, like, pause. There's a lot of things, and I had just gone to this webinar, so I quickly looked at my book, and had concerns. So I started looking through the medical history more and he does have autism, um, but he had recently been over way overweight and he's lost a huge amount of weight and recently. And I asked if there was any surgical, you know, history in the chart cause I couldn't see anything. And he had had a gastric bypass at um, 17 and he has not been taking his vitamins. So those buzzwords were um, on my mind and we looked and it definitely he was mal severely malnourished for a lot of the vitamins and we kind of got him, you know, hooked back into medical and got him some vitamins for home and he did much better. And he watching him through his stay, he did improve neurologically. So it was interesting um, that nutrition has a play in neurology. Yeah, that's definitely such an interesting story. And I'm so glad that that patient was able to, you know, have some positive progress in their time in care. Um, speaking of micronutrients, you know, just as an adult patient's pediatric NFPEs sound like they can be really beneficial for identifying potential micronutrient deficiencies um, or mineral deficiencies. Can you share like some of the similarities or maybe the differences between doing those NFPEs within the pediatric population as opposed to the adult population? Okay, sure. Um, NFP in pediatrics is similar and yet it's different. They're small, they're tiny, they're growing. When I saw them last year, now they're three inches taller than me. Um, there's just so many differences. One thing to do is make sure to include the parents. Um, they notice so many changes in their children. They're very, most of them are very good and, and will help you. And they're really concerned about their nutrition just as much as you are. And they wanna make sure they get it right because they're the ones doing the nutrition. So they feel very responsible. So I always include them, say, hey, I'm just doing an exam. I am just checking to see, are we meeting the needs by the prescription given or by what they're eating, you know, within their medications and their health issues. And then I just talk them through what I'm doing. Um, before I approach the patient, um, you know, I, you know, try to remember what age they are. Young infants may maybe want cuddling and sometimes they're a little scared of, you know, they've got stranger danger, healthcare um, all over. And it's just good to be calming to the younger ones. Um, as you get into that um, toddler age, they're very curious. So showing them what you're doing, showing them, you, you know, if you carry a stethoscope, I don't at this time, but showing them the paper that you're going to measure and showing them on your hands. I want to look at your nails. I want to, I want to see your hair. That's okay. Um, it's very helpful and they'll they'll come up and they'll just shake their hair out and they're very cute and curious um, just as well as just, they're just cute, cute kids. Um, 
as you get older and more mature, sometimes they don't want to, you know, undress. So just talk to them kindly and just try to, you know, edge over. And I just want to see right here if that's okay and go through it nice and calmly because they're, they're still learning their own bodies when they're teenagers. So it's just being respectful and you just want to make sure to document all of those serial changes. Well, this has been such a helpful, you know, conversation about NFPEs in the pediatric setting. And, you know, for those who are interested in engaging more with this topic and learning more, do you have any recommended resources that you or tools um, that you would say that and other RDs might want to look into? There's some really good tools. Um, I've done a lot of reading. So, but um, PD Tools Online is probably the best one. It does... Um, it gives you the, the weight and the Z scores, the height, the BMI, the length. It also gives you the measure of the MUAC and the um, TSF. So that's very helpful um, and it's age appropriate. And I believe the first the first two on the screen um, is actually for, neo, for neonates. So if you have a premature baby that you're dealing with, um, you can put in that age and the gestational age and it'll help you uh, provide an answer for that. So that's one of the best, easiest, quick tools that you can find. Um, A&D, the Academy, and Aspen each have a NFPE pediatric pocket guide. Both of them are very helpful for different reasons. Um, I use them almost every day. So those are great. Um, I Through this paper, I learned about the Tanner growth chart, the pubertal development scale. And I think that that's very interesting. Both of them are online. You can just um, Google them. Uh, I'm going to figure out how to put that into my practice. I do automatically now look for Tanner staging when I check the, the pediatrician's chart. Um, and then I just kind of note from afar if I um, need to um, and only go further. Um, usually I let the docs do the examination. So that's a conversation and you know it's a good team sport because we don't want to have the to do um, repetition with the with the patient getting you know the same exam several times. So just be mindful of that. Um, the academy does have a class or a course on NFPE and pediatrics. So it's very helpful and they go through um, they go through everything. So it's very good. Those are probably my top top resources. That is awesome. And thank you so much for taking the time to chat through this with us. You know, I think NFPEs are becoming really integral in malnutrition diagnoses and kind of that assessment that's happening, you know, every day in the clinical setting. And it's really interesting to hear about how that's working in, in the pediatric space, um, hitting those, you know, developmental milestones for kids in addition to the micro and macronutrients that we'd be looking at with a typical exam. Um, if any of you are interested in this topic, please make sure to check out Michelle's upcoming support line article that will be released in August of 2024. Um, if you have any questions or comments for Michelle, please feel free to leave them in the comments boxes below and we will see you next time. Mm -hmm.